All right, welcome back. Okay, so today we're going to continue our discussion of the internet. We're going to fast forward, and by the end of class, I'm hoping to get to the point where you guys understand a little bit about how some of the web APIs that you may work with on your final project actually work. This mic is too loud today, so we're going to turn it way too loud. Okay, that's better. All right, so just to recap from last time, since I know it was so far ago on Friday. So last time we talked a little bit about um, the internet as a piece of physical infrastructure. We talked about the wires and the cables um, and all the investment that's gone into to create, to creating this. We point out that most of the way that we move data around the internet is actually across wired connections, much higher bandwidth, much more reliable than wireless connections, which are mainly used at the end, right, at the last hop. Um, we talked about the fact that uh, fiber optic cables and incredibly clear glass is an enabling technology for the internet, which is kind of cool, right? Uh, this is something that, you know, you pr might find a little surprising, right? If we didn't have fiber optic cables, uh, the internet design would look very different. It would be much more expensive, much harder to maintain. And, right, okay, so I said that twice. Great. Uh, we also pointed out that, you know, the, your experience of the internet is, is now sort of largely defined by wireless technologies at the edge of the network. Um, that gives you this illusion that the internet is mostly wireless, even though it's not. But your connection to it is typically wireless. How many people here ever still use a computer with a wired internet connection? Ever? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's still some benefits to that. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of, you know, like out of the box, you know, a lot of our PCs used to be you buy a PC and, you know, you plug a, a wire into the back. Now you buy a PC or you buy a Mac and it has wireless built in. And so it hooks up to your wireless network and off you go. Um, there are some bandwidth advantages to using wired connections even in your home. Um, but a lot of times people just default to using a, a wireless connection for pretty much everything. Um, you know, so inside structures, um, even in some cities, actually I remember once being in, um, I think in Berlin and being in a park and there being free Wi-Fi. So sometimes outdoors, but mainly inside in structures that, in, you know, uh, in your dorm room, in this lecture hall, throughout the academic buildings on campus, um, in a lot of restaurants down on Green Street and stuff like that, you find short-range wireless provided by a technology called Wi-Fi. Um, and so that's what you're connected to, you know, a fair amount of the time. If you go roaming out into the wide open spaces in the world, you increasingly find yourself still connected to the Internet, but over a medium-range wireless connection provided by a cellular provider. So that's what those funny shaped towers are doing that we looked at last time. And in a lot of, you know, I don't know what the network map actually looks like for the United States now. The United States is um, a fairly, has some fairly non-dense parts. So if you've ever been to like Eastern Montana, the, the entire population of Montana is smaller than the city of Rhode Island. Um, sorry, the city of Providence, Rhode Island. So there's some space out there. So I'm not gonna argue that we've covered every square inch of this country yet in reasonably high-speed wireless. If you ever go on a road trip, you may find out to your dismay that this isn't true. Um, but we're doing fairly well, um, you know, and particularly in dense urban areas, uh, we're doing extremely well. So if you stay in the cities and particularly along interstate highways, usually you're gonna find yourself connected, still connected to the internet uh, over your phone using um, a medium-range cellular technology. All right, um, and so the result is that, you know, now, by connecting your computer to the internet, you are able to exchange data with like four billion other devices. So this is, you know, again, it's an incredible technological achievement. This is really probably the crowning technological achievement of our era. And it's what's, um, you know, really reshaping society. So if you think about the other types of revolutions that we've gone through as a civilization, the industrial revolution, for example, this is really sort of a, a, an information revolution that's made possible by this core enabling technology. There's nothing inherently, I will argue, there's nothing inherently good or bad about the internet itself. The internet's just a bunch of stuff that we've set up that allows us to communicate uh, in ways that I think our species really longs to at a deep level. But there are certainly both good and bad things going on on the internet today. All right, all right, so again, first connection wireless, you know, and literally at that point, there's a wire. 
So again, if we started at this router right here, actually there it is, I couldn't see it before, but these, these routers here are like hanging on for dear life from the bottom of this, uh, this light rack, right? Here's one of them. Um, if, we, if we grab that, yeah, I can actually see the cable coming out of the back. And if we follow that cable, we could follow it you know, through the wall into a closet here. And if you guys are on Facebook right now, I could take some of your data and I could follow it. I wouldn't be able to keep up. I'm slower than, than the speed of light. Uh, but I could essentially follow the path, right? And we go out probably up to Chicago and then across the country, across a series of extremely high speed internet backbone links, and then eventually into a data center uh, located somewhere in Palo Alto. Although, again, probably now Facebook has some servers close by, maybe up in Chicago, maybe somewhere else in the Midwest. So a lot of times big internet service companies like Google, like Facebook, will co-locate servers closer to where you are to minimize the amount of time it takes to transfer data back and forth. All right. The other thing we talked about was the internet as an agreement. So we built all this infrastructure so that we can connect things together and send signals back and forth across the world. But we need agreements about how we're actually going to do this so that people can talk to each other. Um, the internet protocol specifies, and this is really what defines the internet, right, is the, is the internet protocol, IP really defines two things. First of all, what we call each other. Um, so IP specifies the format of IP addresses. When you bring a machine onto the internet, your computer gets an IP address. Now, is that address unique? Not necessarily. And I don't want to get into that. There's a lot of complication there, particularly due to the fact that we pointed out with IPv4, we don't have enough addresses for every machine that's connected to the internet. And so we started to play some games with this um, in ways that, um, you know, again, introduce some additional complexity in the network that I'm not going to talk about. But in general, if you have a computer and you want somebody else to be able to connect to it, so that's different. Your computer you're using right now makes most connections to other computers. Other computers don't connect to it. That's, a, that's an important distinction. So, if you have a computer on the internet that you want other people to be able to connect to, it has to have something called a publicly routable IP address. Right now, we've got two different formats for these. We have these old format called IPv4. This dotted decimal provides a, a, a total of four billion possible addresses, but the number that you can actually use is much smaller than that. And this was, again, one of the few mistakes that the early creators of the internet made was not providing a large enough address space. So we're fixing that slowly but surely with a long multi-decade rollout of the newest version of the IP protocol called IPv6, which provides 128-bit address space. The addresses are less readable, but there are many, many more of them. And again, in ways that I don't want to get into because it's too complicated to talk about within the space of this class, the additional addresses also eliminate some other problems caused by IPv4. So this is a big change, it's going on. Maybe it'll be completed by the time you guys are old and gray. I've been hearing about IPv6 for decades. This has been going on for a long time. But one of the things about the internet, it's gotten so big, it's so important, that it's very hard to change. And so we're slowly but surely rolling out IPv6. It's happening. A lot of your computers now on campus, if they connect to the campus network, might even get an IPv6 address. But this is a slow process. It's taking a long time. We will get there. We have to get there. There's no way to continue to scale out the internet without using this new um, address protocol. But it has been going on for a long time. OK. So the other thing that IP does is it specifies this format for how each message is going to be transferred. This is sort of where we stopped last time. So IP you know, says, here is where the source and the destination goes. But I want to take a step back and point out something else that was really revolutionary about the internet. Um, and that is, so prior to the internet, we had a global communication network. It was called the phone system. It's run by a small number of companies. And the way that, has, has anyone seen a picture like this before? Does anyone know what you're looking at? Anyone seen, anyone seen like an old movie? Where like someone makes a phone call. What do they do? How does it work? Yeah, so, so the, the woman who's working this, this, uh, this switch, this telephone switch, has a, a microphone on. The reason is you talk to her first. You pick up the phone, and the first connection you get 
is with her, and she says, well, who do you want to call? And you say, oh, I want to call my neighbor, uh, my neighbor uh, Terry or whatever. And she says, okay. And she literally takes a wire right here. See these connections? There's all these different uh, plugs. These are like kind of like a, a microphone cable. She takes out a cable, and she plugs it into a particular slot in the board. And now there's literally a circuit that has been created between your phone and your neighbor's phone, all right? This is something that was called a circuit switched network. Now, eventually the phone companies got more clever and particularly within the core of their network, they didn't need an actual human being. They were able to do this automatically. But there was this fundamental principle that underlay the old phone network that was on some level sort of appropriate for voice-based communications. The idea was when you need to make a call, I establish a circuit between the caller and the recipient of the call. When the call is over, I tear down that circuit. Okay, so this is again something called a circuit switched network. The internet went away from this idea. So on the internet, data is transferred using something called a packet. This is something called packet switching. Right, so um, when you uh, go to Facebook or you go to you know a, a news website or wherever you go or Reddit or whatever, um, the site sends you all the data you need in a series of small units called packets. Those packets are transferred across the internet. They don't have to all follow the same path. So, you know, if you go to, again, I keep using Facebook as an example, but if, if you go to Facebook's website, somewhere in, you know, California or around here, wherever Facebook server is located, Facebook server, okay, okay, here's what they want. Here's the page that they want. I'm gonna break that into a bunch of little pieces and I'm just gonna send them out over the internet. Every one of those little packets is something called an IP datagram. And every one of those packets can potentially follow a different path across the network. It's not usually what happens, but it's possible, okay? Um, so one of the things that's interesting, and we're gonna come back and talk about this later in class, about IP, is that IP, and this was another extremely smart decision that the people who designed the system made. The internet protocol does not guarantee that packets will get from point A to point B. So it's possible that you try to send some data, you know, as part of a chat or as part of a, a web request to uh, another computer on the internet, and some of it, a few packets or all the packets, are lost along the way. They never reach their destination. IP does not guarantee that they will. And again, this is an incredibly intelligent design decision. It turns out to have profound consequences about how the internet works. Instead, IP provides something called best ever delivery. So along the internet at various points, and we're gonna look at that map again in a minute, there are specialized devices called routers. A router is an incredibly expensive single purpose computer that literally spends all day doing one thing. It receives a packet and it figures out which direction to send it in. So a router always has at least three links coming into it it receives a packet from link A, and then it says, should I send this out on, on link B or link C? It does this billions of times a second. So one of the reasons why routers are so specialized is that they're only optimized for that one thing. That's all they do all day long, is move traffic from one of their links to another link as fast as possible. And they're making this decision about where the traffic should go. So let me show you this map again. So you can see at various points throughout the core internet network. So here's a spot where two big pieces of the information superhighway come together. So there's a router located here. This is somewhere in the middle of Iowa. That router is sitting at the intersection of four different paths. So it's possible that if you were in Michigan and you were trying to access a website in, well, if you're accessing something in Minnesota, you're probably gonna go up here, right? Let's say you're in Minnesota and you're trying to access a website in Texas. So you send a packet along this link, it gets here, and that router has three different ways that it can send the packet. It can send the packet in this direction. Let's say you're going to a website, the server is located on the East Coast. It could send it this direction. Maybe you're trying to access a server that's located out in California. And it can send it this direction. So you're headed south. That's all that computer does all day long, is make that same decision over and over and over. Now you can also notice that Let's say that somebody 
um, is careless with a backhoe in Iowa, right around here, and knocks out this link. This happens, not often. I mean, these are pretty well protected at this point. But from time to time, literally, somebody with a backhoe will, like, sever one of these connections, OK? So let's say that this link is gone. What will happen is there's enough redundancy in the network, so instead of going down here, traffic will flow around it. So I can send data here and down, and I'm, now I'm in the same spot. I can send data over here and around. So the internet has this resiliency built into it. This is one of the, um, this, this, this is slightly overplayed. Uh, people have you know, argued that you know, the DOD is really responsible for the internet, and they had this really important thing that it would survive a nuclear attack or something like that. Again, that, that gets a little bit more press than it probably deserves. But there is redundancy and resiliency built into the core internet uh, network um, so that you know, we can route around failures when and if they do occur. So again, this may seem kind of like you know, whatever, right? Um, the packet switching was revolutionary when it was introduced. And it was, it's one of these fun stories about the internet. So that the people who were designing this system um, had you know, come up with this idea about how to move data into, in small units called packets. They had done a lot of theoretical work to show that this would work, that it had desirable properties. Um, and then they met the phone company executives. And the phone company executives, you know, we see this happening right now, right, in our, in our world of technology. You see companies, you know, start up doing one thing, and then the question is, can they evolve? So Netflix, five years ago, people were wondering, can Netflix evolve from being really good at mailing DVDs around to actually being really good at streaming? And it seems like they actually have, right? Um, not everybody's good at that, so Blockbuster went out of business, right? Um, Blockbuster was never able to evolve past the I'm going to give you something to rent and make a lot of money by charging you late fees. Right? Um, the telephone companies at this point in history were extremely good at building circuit switch networks. And so when these crazy people started to approach them about trying to use packet switching, um, they got a lot of pushback. In fact, there's a, there's a story about some of the early designers of the internet um, were pestering the phone company so much that the phone company actually organized like a whole day of presentations by their engineers. Right? It was essentially like, why packet switching will never work? Um, and they you know, came, and they got to know all this stuff about the phone company. And it was essentially like this long attempt to convince these, uh, these, these uh, packet switching guys that they were nuts. So they were right. right? Um, you know, those ideas won eventually. And now, even when you talk on your phone, so if you get on your cell phone and, and start a conversation, very, very quickly, the data starts to be moved as packets across the network, right? Obviously, whenever you use VoIP, Skype, or any sort of like voice over the internet service, that's how things are working. But even the phone companies internally, their core networks are now all largely based on packet switching. Circuit switching is essentially a dead technology that we don't uh, see and use very much anymore. All right, so. So at this point, what we've been talking about is IP. Right? And we still need to get to um, the web. So, but one thing I want to point out that's really important, again, this is sort of design principles of the internet about IP. And this is something that was really important for innovation, is that the internet protocol, the internet protocol is just a way of moving data around. It doesn't really even guarantee that the data is going to get there. But what it does is it allows people to innovate on top of it. The internet protocol. Um, spawn this massive amount of innovation in different types of things that you can build over the internet. The one that you guys are using right now, the web, is only one of the many things that the internet is used for. Sometimes you guys don't realize that, I think, but the internet carries a lot of different types of traffic. So HTTP, you guys are probably familiar with, is a protocol that powers the World Wide Web. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. HTTP is built on top of IP. These are all protocols that transmit data inside IP packets. There's also something called SMTP. This is something that you guys use all the time, even though some of you resent it and aren't very good at it. Um, anyone know what this is? SMTP. Something else you guys do every single day. Some of you, some of you should be doing it more often. What is this? HTTP. 
powers the web. SMTP powers what canonical web application? Yeah. Email. Yeah. This is the simple mail transfer protocol. This is how mail servers talk to each other. So when you send an email message, even if you write the message in your web browser, eventually it gets sent to a server. That server sends the message to other servers using a protocol called SMTP. These are all, like IP, structured ways of arranging communication between two different machines on the internet. We'll talk more about HTTP in a minute. What about DNS? Another core internet protocol. That again, you guys use all the time, even if you didn't realize it. Only one that doesn't end in P. DNS. Anyone ever? No, it's not routing, right? Um, this does something different. It handles a different, important aspect of the internet. Yeah. Yeah, so this is something called the domain name service. It's another service that runs on top of IP. This is what translates names, the human readable names that you guys like to type into your address bar, to IP addresses. So again, you guys could type 192.17.68.8.96.8 into your browser, um, but most of you would probably prefer to type cs125.cs.illinois.edu. Every time you go to a website, this type of human readable address has to be translated into this type of human readable address. That's done using a service called DNS. And j just as a side note, you can play fun games with DNS. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I don't, probably gonna get in trouble for saying this. I don't like ads very much. Um, so one of the things I did recently as a little you know, fun project was I got a Raspberry Pi and I set it up as a DNS server on my home network. Well, the DNS server is run using a piece of software called Pihole. What Pihole does is it uses DNS to block ads. So how does it do that? So essentially, there are specific servers with well-known names that serve a lot of ads. And so now when I'm on my home network, when a web page tries to look up the average, the address to that server, it gets a fake address that returns no content. So this actually works brilliantly, right? But this is a way that you can play around with the underpinnings of the internet. So you can, you can mess with how DNS records are translated. And again, the idea behind IP was we don't want to dictate what's going on in the network. This is very different than other types of computer systems. Bluetooth, for example, has a very different approach. IP said, look, we don't know what people are gonna want to do with the internet, and we don't wanna constrain them in any way. So we're gonna try to make the internet protocol do as little as possible and allow other people to build things on top of it and trust that they will. You could still do this today. If you want to build a new protocol on top of IP, you can do that. And this is happening. People are still developing uh, new protocols to do new things, and they're also developing new protocols to improve on how we do old things, right? So this is something, again, that is really sort of a fount of innovation online, is that IP is flexible. You can do, all it does is try to move data from one place to another, the rest is up to you. All right, so one thing I want you guys to, to recognize, and, and again, this is one of these things that's tough because most of what you guys spend your time doing online is on the web. Our mail is now done through a website, right? Um, but the internet is not the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is a separate thing that exists on top of the internet. Now the World Wide Web, you might argue, is sort of the internet's killer app, right? It's the thing that really drove it to success, but there's a lot of other information that's being transferred around uh, on the internet that is not um, World Wide Web traffic particularly email. Email is still pretty, pretty popular. Okay, but let's talk now about what the web is. Right, so what is the World Wide Web? This is something that won the cre has won the creator uh, knighthood, Turing Award, all sorts of other fun things, right? So what does this encompass? So there's a bun the World Wide Web itself is really built on a bunch of different enabling technologies, and we're gonna look at all of them quickly. So the World Wide Web is a protocol. There's a protocol that's used to move data from a World Wide Web or web server to your computer. We're gonna talk briefly about how that protocol works or two of the most important pieces of it. 
The World Wide Web is also a markup language. So there's something called HTML. HTML describes how a page is supposed to look, or something about the structure of the content that we view online. There's also a styling language associated with the World Wide Web that we'll talk about a little bit as well. This, this really defines how a page is supposed to look. The markup language describes this meta structure of the page, like what a particular element is. CSS describes more about how exactly it looks. What type of font, what size font, you know, how are the borders, you know, arranged and things like that. And then the World Wide Web has also, at this point in time, really become associated with a specific programming language called JavaScript. Because what you download from a web server, when you go to a web server and download a page, and this is true of, I would say, pretty much 99% of web pages today, you're just not downloading content. You're not, it's not like a PDF, it's just something to look at. The web server is also sending you a computer program to run. That computer program is written in a language called JavaScript. Sometimes that computer program is incredibly sophisticated. Sometimes it's simple. But pretty much every website you go to today provides this small or large or extremely huge and complex program to go along with the content. Okay. So let's talk about the protocol first, briefly. So HTTP is a protocol that runs on top of IP. Like other protocols, it needs to specify how certain operations are performed. Now there are many different types of requests that HTTP outlines, but there's two, really one and a half, that you really need to understand. The, and particularly if you're working with web APIs, there's really two that you really need to understand. So they are called get and post. And they kind of do what they sound like. So every time you load a web page, your browser sends a HTTP GET request to the server. That GET request starts, uh, that GET request is a request for the server to send it a piece of content that it needs to view that page. So the first thing you do is you request the HTML document that that page, uh, uh, for the page you're looking at, and then there are other GET requests that are used to request other parts of the page as well, okay? Now, so that's GET. So again, I think maybe 95% of traffic online are GET requests. Most of the time, you're asking a server for information. But there's also times when you send the server some information. And this is done using something called a POST. So a POST, every time you submit a form, when you buy something online, or when you register for a site, or when you kick, click send in a chat box, or when you post something on Facebook, there's a separate request used for this, it's called a post. A post allows you to send data to the server. Right? And this is, again, used for uh, cases where you need to send the server some information in order to perform some operation. Right? You're browsing on Amazon, most of that browsing is done using get requests because you're essentially asking Amazon to show you different stuff. And then you get to the point where you're actually going to buy the thing. And now you have to provide information. You have to provide a credit card number and your address and all that stuff. Those components of the interaction are done using post messages. So th there are, di and, and there are different semantics for these because of the nature of the request. So when you do a get request, nothing about the world changes. Right? You're just being sent information. So when you, now, now that's not exactly true, right? Because if you, you know, for example, let's go back to Amazon as the example. If you're on Amazon and you start looking at stuff and you look at a lot of like tree trimmers, right? Next time you go to Amazon, they're gonna show you a bunch of tree trimmers, right? Uh, to buy. But in general, you know, get is supposed to be something that doesn't really change anything about the state of the server. Post, on the other hand, does change something. How many people have seen that warning about like, you know, don't post this twice or don't hit submit twice or whatever, like when you're buying something? Happily, we've sort of made this go away because there's been some better technology deployed. This, this used to be ubiquitous. Like every time you submitted a form, there were these like big warnings about like, do not hit submit twice or you will purchase, you know, multiple, you know, do doohickeys or whatever, right? Uh, but when you post something, when you hit submit on a form, something about the world does change. You paid your bill, you dropped the class, or you registered for a class, or you now have an account on that site, right? There's something, or you've added something to your Facebook profile. Something about the world is different. 
afterwards. So this, and again, this is why you see these warnings sometimes about repeated posts, because it's safe to load the same website over and over again. Nothing about the world is changing, but if you hit post over and over again, sometimes you might post the same message in the chat eight times. Okay. So now let's look at HTML. Let's look at the contents, the things you actually get when you uh, load a web page. How many people have, have seen something like this before? Ever? So one of the things I, I want to point out, hold on, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do a, uh, maybe I'll do a quick demo here. One of the things that's really cool about, um, about this particular technology is how available it is for you to mess around, right? Um, so this is Chrome. Um, if you right click on Chrome, there's, a, there's an option called inspect. And now you've, you've essentially kind of like launched Android Studio for Chrome, right? This is a uh, tool that will allow you to see all sorts of information about the page, it shows you what's happening uh, as you load the page. Um, it'll show you messages that are printed off by JavaScript as the page runs. So again, I'm not gonna do a long tutorial about this, but if you ever want to know more, um, this page inspector, it's also available on Safari and Firefox, similar, similar tools. Like this provides an enormous amount of information, right? There's really no equivalent of this for anything else you use. Um, one of the reasons this exists is because it's heavily used by people who actually develop things for the web, right? But there's no equivalent on Android, or there's no equivalent on your operating system to show you all this information. It's actually pretty, pretty awesome that, that this stuff exists. All right, anyway, done, done with the short demo. So here's how, here's how HTML looks. So this is what the server is actually going to send you when you request a particular web page or something like this, right? So remember, we're talking about a computer. Everything that tra gets transmitted has to be a number. And so I don't, you know, if I want to tell you that a particular part of the page should be a heading, I have to somehow mark that. And so what HTML is, it's with something called a markup language. If you've posted on our course forum, you've used a markup language called Markdown. The different markup language uses different syntax. HTML is similar in spirit. So here, for example, this is a tag. This is not shown to you when you open the page. But what this is doing is it's telling the browser that this, this is the closing tag. You see a, the forward slash followed by the same name, right? So this is an H1 tag that tells the browser this is a first level heading. This is, this is an important title on the page. Down here, here's a paragraph of text. So you'll see I start with this tag, and I end with this tag. This is a paragraph tag that tells the browser what comes next is a single paragraph. You can see how to, this is how a list is marked up. This is something called an OL. Does anyone, any of the web developers here remember what an OL is? There's two types of list in the world, yeah. An ordered list. Meaning that by default, the browser will show you numbers. Every one of these is a list item. So I have to say both that this is a list, everything in between this OL and the close OL, and then I also, for every single item in the list, I have a separate tag, LI, which is a list item that indicates the start and end of things that appear in the list. And again, because this is an OL, this is, um, this is an ordered list. And by default, it'll be shown using one, two, three. If I use a UL, that's an unordered list, and I get bullets. All right, so here's how that looks. Here's essentially exactly that text rendered by your browser. So here's what gets sent to the browser, here's what you actually see. The browser has decided to make this bigger because I said it was a heading. So it says, oh, it's more important, so I'm gonna make the text larger. Um, you can see that there's some vertical space here but before and after the paragraph. That's because it's a paragraph, so by default, each paragraph will get a little extra spacing. Here's my list, and then I had a couple of other tags. This is a bold tag, or strong, and then this is italics, I. 
All right, great. So now how, so, the, the, so now there's this question of where did this content come from? So it came from the server, but what process creates this content? And this is an area where we've seen an enormous amount of change and evolution in how the internet has been designed over the years. So originally, a lot of websites serve what's called static content. So when you make a request, literally there's a file somewhere that contains exactly the content that is sent back to your browser. This is actually how most of our CS125 website works. Still, still in use today for certain, for certain applications, it works fine. However, increasingly, what you see is something called a dynamic website, meaning that when you make the request, so again, when you go to Amazon, if all of you guys go to Amazon.com, every one of you is gonna see a different page. Why? It's because Amazon has information about you that it uses when it renders the page, what you might like to look at, you know, things that you've been browsing before, right? So clearly there's not like one web page that gets sent to everybody that goes to Amazon.com. So what's happening is, when you go to Amazon, the um, behind the scenes, they have code that runs. It says, okay, who is this person? And then it looks up all your browsing history, and it's like, okay, are there any special things we need to put on the page? There's all, it's, it's code, it's computer code that runs, that makes all these decisions. You guys could write this code, or at least you could recognize it if it was in Java, which it probably is not. When it's done, it spits out a big web document that gets sent back to you that is personalized for your browser, right? And there's all sorts of things that Amazon knows about you in this process. It probably knows who you are. It probably knows where you are. It takes your IP address and uses that to figure out what general region you're in. That's why when you go overseas, suddenly you get google.com.uk rather than google.com because Google can tell your IP address indicates that you're in the United Kingdom, and so it gives you a different version of its website. Same thing with Amazon, right? Finally, the, 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 a lot of the sites you guys use today have, have really sort of totally broken out of this model, right? Where most of what's being done, and this, this would require like a whole nother semester to fully explain, but most of what's being done is being done by JavaScript. So essentially what you're downloading is not a page, it's an application that then is in charge of rendering the page. So for example, our grades site that you guys use is an example of this. It's built using a framework called Meteor. Our discourse uh, course forum is an example of this. This is built, uh, the back end is in Ruby on Rails and the front end I think is in, I should know this, Angular, I think. I might be wrong. But Anyway, the idea is that when you click on uh, links on our forum, the web server isn't sending you a whole nother page. It's sending you just a little bit of extra information that's used to render this page. So again, this is the, the modern paradigm for how a lot of interactive websites work. Google Docs, same thing. If you want to convince yourself of how powerful this model is, try doing the following. This, is, this has gotten hard to do. Disable JavaScript. Has anyone ever tried this? There's these like security weirdos out there who are like, oh, you should never run JavaScript. Like, a lot that, you don't hear that a lot anymore because it's like impossible. You can't use the internet without it. So try disabling JavaScript in your browser. Make sure you remember how to re-enable it because you're gonna want it back in like 10 seconds, okay? And then go to like Google Docs, go to Gmail, go to your music site, go to Facebook, see if anything works, right? Some sites will work, sort of. So if you go to like a news site, a lot of times, most of the news site will load, but then like the breaking news part won't load or the videos won't load. But like there's a lot of sites that are just pure brokenness without JavaScript. Our course forum will not work, period, without JavaScript, right? So these sites are literally applications. When you go to the site, you're getting an, a program. And that program is now doing everything else, including uh, rendering the page on the fly to make it look like a website even though it's not. All right, so let's talk about a couple of the other core web components. Um, there's, a, there's a markup language, a separate uh, markup language called CSS that defines how things look. Um, I'm, again, I do not want to get into this in detail. This says the body of the page should use a sans serif font, and this indicates how I should render elements on the page that are tags of type H1. So it says, specifies the font size and the font weight. So now you can see compared to, let me go show you the before, 
So here's my before. You see I've got a serif font. Oh, sorry, too far. Okay. And now, here's my app. You can see the font's different. The H1 is bigger with respect to the rest of the page, et cetera. So this is, CSS is primarily used to describe how the page looks visually. All right? And then again, finally, this, this really fun component, I hope some of you guys will go off and explore this because this is really cool, right? If you want to deploy an app today, this is the best way to do it, is to write it in JavaScript and deploy it on the internet. So along with your website, you get a little program. And again, I'm not gonna explain this, this is computer code, it's not computer code that I expect you to recognize. Um, you can sort of like, I guess, like if you squint at it, like this is a variable, right? I'm making some sort of function call. I have a conditional statement, right? There's some idioms here that aren't gonna make a lot of sense, right? Um, I, I'd be curious if anybody knows what this does, but I'm gonna show you. Look at that. Blinking text, anyone remember blinking text? The, the, the web used to be full of blinking text, and then essentially we killed off MySpace and it's all gone. Um, so, and that's actually not a bad thing. Like, tr 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 as, as, some, as someone who's like a traveler from the past, trust me, the web was way uglier before, way uglier. Um, we've made a lot of progress with design. You used to see a lot of this. Go to a website, big flashing text all over the place, you know, like orange text on a red background, stuff like that. Um, you know, like, uh, uh, we've, like I said, we've, we've cleaned a lot of that up, right? Getting rid of MySpace helped a lot. Um, okay. So, now you know a, just a brief bit about what the web is. And so let's, let's finish up today, and then let's leak a little bit into Wednesday about talking about what is a web API. Yeah, question. Uh, you have to use an API or a new feature of some kind. Yeah, API is one option. Yeah, that'll be, so the final project write-up will be out today. You don't have to use the web API, but it's one option, and, and something I would encourage you to do. It's one of the easier ways to build something cool quickly. Okay, so, now we know what the web, web is, and we know one of the primary uses of the World Wide Web was delivering content to users. So a certain amount, and I actually don't know what the fractions are, it'd be really interesting to find out, right? But a certain amount of the content that's moved around on the web, on that particular application of the internet, is still stuff that's gonna go into your eyeballs, right? Pages you're gonna look at, you know, con you know, chats that you're participating in, whatever. But we've also started to use the web for something else. This is kind of a neat story about how a particular technology stack can be reused. So we talked a little bit about this when we talked about interfaces, right? So a web, an API is an application programmer interface. And what that is, is it's some interface that someone has set, has set up to allow you to build applications. It's an interface for application programmers. So it exposes some content that someone thinks is useful that you might want to use as part of your application. So again, you guys did the, a, the API MP, so you know how that works. You didn't have to build a framework for doing machine learning on top of images. I don't believe you wouldn't be able to do that, but it might take you like a decade. Instead, you used a API that Microsoft set up for you. So here's an example, right, of, of an API. Um, and this is sort of like what it would look at, look like from a Java perspective. Here are Java functions. So this is sort of, now we can think of this as almost like an interface. I think I should go back next semester and replace this with a slide showing an interface. So here is, let's say I have something where I want to find the weather. So I've got a function here called get at location that takes some type of object called a weather location and returns some type of object called a weather, some type of weather info object. And you can assume that this weather location object, you know, has information in it that specifies the location that I want to ask for the weather. And the weather info object has information that specifies what the weather is at that location. So it's like a function call. Here's another version of that function where I'm asking at a particular date, right? And then here's maybe a way to uh, look up different locations, right? So if I have a string, like the user entered champagne, right? Uh, can you give me a list of weather locations that correspond to that string that I could show in a drop-down menu or something like that? Okay. 
So a web API in many ways, and again, you guys, you guys sort of saw this when you did um, MP3, is like another interface, except you access it over the web. So that interface is provided by a bunch of servers somewhere, and your application to use it makes HTTP requests. Now, the thing that we have to note here is that um, so, so how is this going to work? Let's try to see how we can map our idea of an interface where I need to be able to provide parameters and receive information in return into this HTTP world. So I can send data to the web server using a post request. So if I can find a way to take, for example, my weather location object and somehow convert it to a string, I can send it using a post request to the server. So I can essentially pass data just like I would pass it to a function to the server by using a post request. The server can then run some code, right? So this is like a library that you would use. You would make a function call, some code would execute. How do I get the result back? And it can return a response. Now here's the thing that's interesting. So up, up until this point, we've talked about the information that's that is provided by websites as being formatted in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Like, that's what you get back when you go to a website. But the documents returned by a web server do not have to be HTML. They can be anything. They can be text. They can be whatever I want. And so here's the thing that I'm going to, okay, and, and, and then let me t just, as a brief aside, talk a little bit about why this, this started to happen. So um, there are security measures called a firewall that are put up to prevent uh, people from accessing certain ports on, on computers. And so as a way to work around that, a lot of um, APIs started to, rather than set up a custom protocol to expose weather information, I just expose it as, as a website over the same port that web traffic travels. All right, so, so now let's again, let's go back to our function and think about how we're actually gonna get this data to the web server. So how are we gonna send arguments? So there's a couple different ways I can do this. One is that I can have the client make a request where the information is included in the URL. So maybe this is my API, this identifies the function, and now in the third part of the URL, I actually identify, I insert a string which identifies the location that I want the weather for. So that's one way to do this. A second way is to use something called HTTP query parameters, which I'm not gonna cover in detail. Um, but this is another way of sending data as a series. So you might see these. How many people have noticed this in some of your URLs when you browse around the internet? Look next time, right? It's usually there. So if, if you look up in your browser bar, the URL will end with a question mark, and then afterwards, you'll see a series of a string, equal sign, and then some other string. And then if you have more than one, they're separated by ampersand. These are actually arguments to that get request. This is very similar to passing arguments to a function. The other thing I can do is I can use a post request and I can stick the data about the location into the body of the post request. And a lot of times I'm gonna do that using JSON, which you guys are already familiar with. This is a way for me to take the information I want about that identifies the location I want weather about, convert it to a string, and stick it into the message. So these are three different ways that I can transfer the data about the request to the server. So the server knows what location do you want weather information for. There are lots of different ways to return results as well. Remember, the, the web server does not have to send me an HTML document, it can send me anything. One of the most common ways to do this is to use something you guys are already familiar with from MP3, which is JSON. So when you use a web API, what you get back is not HTML. Instead, you might get back something that looks like this. And in fact, this is, actual, this is an actual response from a real weather API that I excerpted and stuck in here. So you can see this identifies the weather state name. Apparently it was thundering at that point. Um, here's the date. This was almost a year ago. And then there's actually a bunch more information down here identifying every component of the weather that you could possibly want. 
right? So this is the basic building block of how we take the web, which was designed to send around documents and use it to make function calls and retrieve information. All right, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Just a note on this week's quiz is on sorting. Um, also, there's no homework problem today. In case you were confused, we'll start up again tomorrow. Um, good luck finishing up MP4s. Do it at 5 p.m. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.